Hello everyone. Good evening, Charlotte here. Sorry, I came out and then came in again because I realised that I hadn't, um, I didn't know if the title had been added actually. So I came out and wanted in again and just re-add the title. So I think we're all sorted now. Thank you so much for joining me this evening for Top Tip Tuesday. Thank you so much. Hello, Glambles. Hello, Andrew. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining me for Top Tip Tuesday. And this evening, we are going to talk about preparing our home in an enriching environment, um, in a Montessori way, our enriching environment at home in a Montessori way, in a way that's simple, ordered and accessible. Um, the reason that this came up particularly was that I attended an um, online global Montessori event on Sunday, this gone, Sunday gone, the 30th of August, in celebration of Dr. Montessori's, what would have been her 150th birthday. And in this amazing, amazing, inspiring and such an uplifting and empowering global event, we were talking about one of the, the forums that were that were in there was about um, social media and the power of social media and how we can bring Montessori and Montessori parenting and the way of life into more homes and more families. And one of the comments that was made about um, social media and in particular something like Instagram um, is that because it's very, very visual, um, what we end up seeing, and ourselves included, what we end up seeing is... Um, you know, these perfect images of these immaculate homes um, where, and, and Montessori style online seems to be mainly, um, certainly, certainly amongst Western whites, I would say, is sort of the creams and the whites and, um, you know, everything in that type of, uh, type of style. And, you know, a lot of light and, and larger houses and what have you. Um, but they high Kate. Um, but the reality is a lot of our homes aren't like that. A lot of our homes aren't completely cream and white. A lot of us don't live in big houses. A lot of us live in one bedroom or two bedroom apartments, you know, in a high rise or wherever we may are in the world. Some people don't live in spaces like that at all and have several families living in the same home. So we are uh, several families or several generations living in the same home. So really what we were saying in this high nona, in this... Um, in this debate war, this forum we were having, is that how important it is to think about when we are engaging on social, social media, are we engaging or disengaging from people by what we're presenting? And the essence of Montessori is not a perfect environment. The essence of Montessori is a simple, ordered and accessible environment. And that doesn't mean that it's going to look perfect. It's going to look perfect the whole time. And it's beautiful, but a beautiful according to you and your cultural heritage and what's relevant for you. And for lots and lots of people, a very, very um, clean, pale coloured environment might be exactly their dream. But think of how many people we're being disengaged, that we are disengaging from, if we are just presenting this one image of what Montessori can be and what an enriching environment can be like. So... Um, with that in mind, I just wanted to talk about this this evening, actually. Talk about how um, we can make our environments um, more authentic to who we are and we don't want them to look like anybody else's. I wanted to talk about... Um, uh, what was I going to say? I can't remember now. Oh yes, the three things to think about when you're preparing your environment. That's what it was, three things. So... Um, keep it simple, and this is quoting from one of the forums I was in on Sunday, so keep it simple, keep it real, and use what you have. So keep it simple is as it says, keep it simple, don't try and do everything all at once, you don't need educational materials for your child until the age of six, for example, or maybe even older. So don't worry about getting specific Montessori materials. Don't worry about what your child is or is not learning. Be immersed in them, in their joy of learning, their joy of exploration. Um, let joy bloom in your life together as you learn together, you know, with your first child, with your second child, with every child. There's such a huge learning curve 
So we don't need to focus so much on what our environment looks like. It's very important that our, our environment is accessible for our children. Yes, of course, it's very important that it's simple so they can actually see what they want to do. And it's very important that it's, their space is ordered so they have that um, reliability and that consistency of being able to find the same thing on the shelf. Um, but it does not need to look perfect or be perfect or be in a, a certain colour or a certain style in order to be enriching for our child. So number one, keep it simple. Number two is keep it real. And by that, um, I'm talking about keeping it real to your culture, to your, um, to your race, to your heritage, to your religion, whatever it might be. And just simple things like sourcing books that are in your or your partner's mother tongue, your family's mother tongue. If you're lucky enough to be a multilingual household, then get as many books um, in in different languages, in all the languages you have in your home. Um, don't think that English is, um, and I know it is a lot of the world, and that's because of uh, you know the, the hangover of colonialism, that English is seen as this... Um, as, as better or superior to um, to other languages, but that's not the case at all. It's whatever is your cultural identity, whatever is your mother tongue that you and your, your partner and wider family members, whatever your child is listening to, speak to them in that your mother tongue, your culture, your heritage is more important than learning English. Um, so really, really focus focus on that and see how you can source books um, or if you don't have any books available in your mother tongue what about um, telling stories your um, parents and your grandparents will have undoubtedly uh, stories in their culture that have been passed down from generation to generation if you don't have books in your own language that's okay tell beautiful elaborate stories that have been passed down from previous generations um, so keep it real to, to who you are and who your family is and your values are. You don't need to um, rely. And there's, there's amazing aspects of every culture. But what I mean is you don't need to water down or whitewash your own culture to try and um, fit into a certain way that um, your home should look or a westernized ideal of um, perfection. That's, I think, the point I'm trying to make. And I hope I've made it eloquently. So keep it real to your family and your family values um, because it's, it's exhausting enough being a parent and then trying to be somebody else because you've seen their stuff on Instagram is going to be even more exhausting. So just um, be true to, to who you are. And then the third point is use what you have. So um, in terms of using what you have, so let's give you an example. Oh yeah, okay, so use what you have. When Olivia was a baby, um, she was nine months old and she started, and, and nine months is around the age where children understand object permanence. And that is when they realize that something still exists when it's in another room. So for example, even if I'm not in the kitchen, I know that the kitchen, sorry, even if I'm not in the kitchen, I know that the kettle is still in the kitchen, even though I can't see it. And that happens in a child about nine, ten months old. And so you can get some beautiful materials for an object permanence box. And this is how the child teaches that. And you put a toy or a piece of work or a piece of wood or something in the box and they open and close the drawer and they realise that the item is still there. And this is a specific piece of material. It's a specific developmental stage. And I didn't, um, I didn't have access to an object permanence box and, and we couldn't afford to ship one of these over from the UK or the US or anywhere else that made, made materials. So I made my, ob my first object permanence box from a shoe box and, um, that I think the ch children's father's trainers came in um, and a tennis ball. And that's how I did it. And I just cut a tennis ball size hole in the top of the shoe box and popped the ball in. And then Olivia... Over the period of time, she learned that she just had to hit, lift the lid, you know, the flap of the shoebox in order to get the ball out again. So um, in terms of use what you have, that's an example. Another example would be um, we know that we should use small child size, um, the correct size for the hands, you know, in glasses and drinking things and jugs. You can use jam jars instead. We use jam jars actually to drink, um, to drink our drinks, water and tea and what have you in our house. You can just get tiny jam jars. You probably have at least a dozen jam jars in your kitchen cupboard somewhere. You don't need to go and buy lots of extra glasses um, for the right size. Find a small jam jar and that's probably going to be right for your piccolini, you know, about this size for their little tiny hands. 
Um, and again, then use a slightly larger jug jar as, as the jug to pour the water into. Something like that. Um, what else could I say? Oh yes, the, instead of buying those beautiful wooden trays um, that we all love and are gorgeous and synonymous with Montessori, you could just use the cardboard trays, and I do this, use the cardboard trays, you know, that fruit and veg come in, in your fruit and veg delivery or um, the way they're packaged when you buy them. Things like that. So. Um, I hope I'm making myself clear that it's really, really use what you have. And in terms of cultural enrichment, um, things like you could, instead of going to buy artwork, we have all of the, our pictures and artwork and things we've accumulated over the years, all low down at the children's height. Um, I didn't buy anything new for them. Everything was just, everything is just as it is. And if I want to add things, what I can do is, um, you know, you receive a birthday card, a really beautiful birthday card. It's a shame to throw it in the bin, to throw it away or to keep it in a box. Laminate it and stick it on the wall at their height. Frame it, and you know, a cheap um, frame from Ikea or a supermarket or somewhere and put it on the wall at their height. We can enrich their lives. You know, a beautiful postcard from a museum you go to or an art gallery or someone gives you. Um, we can do so much um, with very, very few resources. And um, an example of this actually is that Montessori is used, the Montessori method is used a lot in refugee camps. And in refugee camps, there are n no resources. They have to use what they have. And there are some incredible, incredible stories. And there's a great film um, called Corner of Hope. And that's produced by AMI, the original Montessori Association that Dr. Montessori established. And this is a program of a refugee camp in Kenya um, and it shows how the people in the refugee camp and it was mainly the, the, the women who were brought together and were taught Montessori education um, you know from parenting and from teaching and they actually set up a classroom just from the materials they had in the refugee camp obviously they don't have the resources to buy equipment and anywhere to store them and things like that so they, they used the resources that they had and that is so incredibly inspiring. We don't need to overcomplicate things and overcomplicate our lives by trying to get from here to here. We can just take one step, one really, really small step to use what we have. And then as the environment develops and grows, then we can... Sorry, I think I just paused it and it said... Um, as the environment develops, then we will develop as well. Um, so it's all about the joy of being together, the joy of learning together. Let joy bloom in your environment and we've talked a bit about the physical environment now and let's now talk about the emotional environment and what it really means to be a Montessori parent because if we are um, we have all the physical environment sorted and we do have an Instagram perfect physical environment but we are not bringing it through into the philosophy and the way that we're speaking to our children and the way that we are interacting with them, then the beautiful environment isn't going to make that much of a difference. What really um, makes a difference is knowing within ourselves that we we are the guide to our children. You, we can be the guide. We don't need a Montessori qualification or um, a respectful parenting qualification or positive parenting qualification. We can do this. We can trust our inner wisdom and we can trust our um, inner knowledge. We we birthed our children, we we can just use that guidance, that our inner guidance, to learn with them, let joy bloom in our lives together as we learn with them. We get curious, that's the, the main thing with our children, is to get curious. We notice what they're interested in, and then we sit and we observe and we get curious. Why are they fascinated with that um, that cushion cover? My son, when he was a baby, he was absolutely obsessed with this um, this beautiful red cushion cover. It's um, it's a shui shui fa fabric from South Africa, and we used to live in Cape Town before we were here in Dubai. And he would spend like, and he was a tiny baby, you know, four or five months. He'd spend most of his time on his front, and even when he woke up from a nap, the first thing he would do would lift his head and sort of wriggle a little bit, and then focus on this on this cushion. He'd spend 20, 30 minutes just staring at the pattern on this cushion. Um, and it made me and Olivia, um, who was who's who is older than him, you know, really, really curious what he was so interested in. And so the observation of him really 
helped us understand him and what his what his needs were and he was really really drawn to these bright colors he was really drawn to this detail there was something about this cushion that really uh that just totally did it for him um so i'd say the three things let's go for three things to be a montessori parent what what do we what do we need um one we can we can step back and stepping back means resisting our urge to fix things or to make things better or to always have the answer um because very often particularly as they get older we're not going to have the answer and this you know this is something um i may be saying this with some sort of authority in my and, and wisdom in my voice but it's not something i'm i'm feeling at all you know i really find find it hard as we all do to be in those situations where we feel uncomfortable like our child has behaved in an uncomfortable way or our child is feeling something and is very emotional about something that's happened and we want to make it better for them we want to fix it for them because we're their parent that's completely normal but a much harder thing to do is to be there and support them um and know we can't make it better we can't stop them from doing something that's undesirable we can't um make it better if they've hurt themselves or someone's upset them but we can just try and see it through clear eyes see it through a lens that isn't clouded with our own childhood our own triggers and if you work out how to do that then let me know because I'd, I'd love to know um so it's just trying to see it from to try and ensure that we step back for that moment and create that gap between our own emotions and how we feel about the situation and what actually really what really really is happening what's happening in the moment because what happens when something difficult happens with our with our child what happens within us is that it triggers an emotional memory unconscious memory from something that was said to us um in childhood or something that was done to us and we were talking about this in the event on sunday and someone saying when when our when something comes out of our mouth um that isn't a reflection of the parent we want to be like our reaction to our child or a judgment or what have you we can just ask ourselves really gently the question you know who who said that to me before where have i heard that before and then we get to unpick a little bit of the uh, of the emotional stuff um but the main thing is that stepping back is all about us trusting our children have a journey and trusting in their innate goodness and that even when then they're at the most vile and unbearable and, and illogical it is their journey our role is to support them we can't make it better no matter how much we want to but we can support them while they're working through things we can stop them if they're little and and i don't know they're hitting someone or doing something or breaking something we can physically stop them with our hands but we can't do any more than that we can have conversations about it we can have discussions about it and we can show empathy in the way that we behave and we can um a way that i deal with a lot of um what's the word issues isn't the right word any hiccups i say that have happened in our day is at the end of the day when we're going through the story of our day we lie in bed and we read a story of the day rather than reading a book sorry I tell the story of the day we tell the story of the day together and we go through everything that's happened and if it's something that's happened during the day that has been upsetting or something that you know was undesirable behavior um then we can just talk about it in a very uh in a very open open way you know oh, what happened earlier today with your friend and and also I use a lot of storytelling in terms of um Olivia La and Harry love stories of their teddies being told to them so I'll give their teddies characters and then something will happen and one teddy will hit another teddy and then we go through that scenario of talking about how people would have felt in that scenario talking about um how both sides of both teddies would feel so things like that where it's not it doesn't sound like a moral lesson or I hope it doesn't sound like a moral lesson it doesn't sound like a moral judgment it's taking examples of what has happened in real life and then bringing it back to their level and to their age of uh, their stage of development so that they don't feel pressurized it's not a great big lecture about you did this and you did that or what have you and also things that they might not understand um we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where um some children in the park were being unkind about harry um and i removed him from the situation because i didn't want it to go any further 
but then later that that evening you know we we talked about that in a very um in a very gentle way and tried to be in a non-judgmental way as well so that um we weren't labeling these children who had said these unkind things as anything we were just just trying to explain to harry you know to validate obviously his feelings about it and to explain that that's what happens and try and see a way of um, moving forward from that so we didn't need to hold on to it and mostly so I didn't need to hold on to it actually. Um, so stepping back is the first thing of our three ways in order to be um, a parent that empowers our child. That's what we really want to do, a parent that be is a, a parent that empowers our child. So one step back. Um, number two is observe and that's I guess part of stepping back. So observe what they're doing, observe what they're really doing, what their interests are. When we um, know what their interests are, that's what that's how we know how best to serve them. That's what Dr. Montessori talked about, is talked about serving the child. Um, not as a servant, but someone who attends to someone else's needs. So if we follow their interests, if we notice when they're really fascinated with ants, then we can find a poem about ants. Then we can collect some ants in a jar and then take a magnifying glass and look at them closer. Then we can spend 20 minutes on our walk outside or time outside, you know, just really studying an ant's nest and everyone going in and out and, um, you know, working out how many legs they have and things like that. Following their interest is what really um, lets them learn about the world. It's like giving them, it's like giving them a key, basically, or allowing them to unlock themselves that's how they unfold themselves if we decide what they're going to be interested in then how will they ever know they won't know what their preferences are they might like everything that we offer to them but what's more powerful is to follow their interests for us to notice and that can be hard sometimes to really observe them and notice what they're interested in because we have our own agenda and we have our own schedule but really if we can follow their interests then that gives them this gift of learning learning is it comes naturally to children. It comes naturally to all humans, actually. Um, it's, uh, it comes naturally to them. So we want to foster that love of learning. It's there already, but how can we make it this explosive love of, uh, of learning by following what they're interested in? Um, and then the other side of observing is observing situations, observing what they're doing, observing what um, their, your baby is reaching for, observing what, I don't know, what forms your preschool is making when she's drawing, observing everything what they do, and then you see what um, what they're struggling with, what they're managing. You're seeing um, where they are in that moment. And when we know where they are at the moment, what they're doing at that moment, then it stops us from rushing in. And that goes back to the first point of stepping back and letting them have their own experience. We want to empower them to continue and to problem solve and to work things out in their way and that's part of observation so we can see really where we where they are so they're not jumping in too mm -hmm. soon and we can see what they're interested in as we've said and we can see when our baby is trying to roll over for example even you know something as um as incredible as observing a newborn a newborn who we would think is completely immobile and isn't that interesting at all but wow a newborn is so fascinating to observe because you see the way their eyes move as they see the shadows on the ceiling so it's, or notice the shadows in the room you know as the light changes you can put a simple mobile of a twig with some leaves on it for a newborn to gaze at just put it above their head I mean that is so powerful and then observe what your baby is looking at what they're doing with their hands you know the newborn move an incredible amount when they're awake and actually when they're asleep they move as well and it's just so incredible the bond and the connection we get when we observe so that would be my second point of um how to empower our children is to uh observe them and whether they're whether they're any age you know whether they're a newborn or or throughout childhood because then we really know we really know our child and then the third point to um be a parent who empowers their children is to listen and I guess like the first two points step back and observe it's just it's not putting our own agenda on them it's waiting for them to speak to tell us what they need to say to not finish a sentence for them to let them express what they 
need to before we impose ourselves on them. Um, and that's listening to their answers, that's listening um, to whatever it is they have, whether they're verbal or, or pre-verbal, listening to what it is that they have to say, listening to their explanations when there's been a misunderstanding or a disagreement, you know, that would be for an older child, that's really, really important. Particularly in the six to nine group where, um, six to nine ages, where children get a really strong sense of social and moral justice. And they're really forming these ideas about morality and justice in this period. So it's really important that if, when there are disagreements, you know, um, between siblings or between friends, we're particularly um, mindful to hear both sides of the story when there are disagreements. Um, and particularly when things get physical, it's easy to, um, to jump to conclusions, isn't it? But it's really crucial that we are able to open our hearts, that we do see both sides of the story. And in the six to nine age group, it's because morality is such an important um, part of this, this stage of development, you see a lot of um, what would be traditionally called as uh, being a telltale. So parent, um, children will rush up to you and go, he did this or she did that and what have you. And, and certainly the way I was um, brought up was, you know, don't be a telltale or don't be a snitch or what have you. But actually, that's an important part of this, of this age group from six onwards, because they're, they're working out morality and, um, and moral justice. They, um, they don't know what's right and what's wrong, and they do need our support sometimes, or they need to come and tell someone that something's happening which isn't quite right. Um, they might not need us to fix it, but they might need to ask us a couple of questions that will then allow them to unfold and then go back and resolve the problem with their peers. So... Number three of how to be a parent that empowers is um, listen. Just listen, listen, listen much more. And that goes for adults as well. Any type of communication, any type of relationship building, it's listening far, far more than, um, than speaking. Um, so I think, unless anyone has any questions, that's everything that I wanted to cover this evening. It's um, our prepared environment, when we talk about the physical environment, is simple ordered, accessible and beautiful, but that's beautiful as in culturally relevant. Um, use what you have, keep it real and keep it simple. Uh, you don't need to buy lots of expensive equipment unless that's available to you. Um, use the beauty that you find in your own home, in your own culture. And the three things that you can do, environment aside, in order to empower, to be a parent that empowers your child, is one, step back to let them have their own experience. Two, observe our children so we can see what where they really are what they really need what their interests are and the third thing is to listen more than we speak so i hope you've all enjoyed today's uh, this evening's session thank you so much for joining me and um i will see you again soon my website is enrichingenvironments.com i'd love you to have a look on there i am at enriching environments on facebook and on instagram and my, I have great news regarding my film series that we did over the summer with Yoga House. Um, thanks, Kate. Um, the uh, film series from Yoga House um, that we did over the summer. Yoga House have actually invited me back to continue the series on a monthly basis, um, starting from September. So we're going to have lots more films about early childhood, um, and lots more discussions about early childhood that I'll be broadcasting on Instagram Live. So for everyone who's based in Dubai, I feel really excited to take this series um, further than we thought we were going to over the, um, <laughs> over, the, over the summer. Really excited to have all of these um, discussions with you and show you some really, really incredible films on childhood and early childhood education to inspire us all to be the best version of ourselves we can for our parents. Um, as parents. So, um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Kate. Jam jar tip is genius. Yeah, <laughs> it's, isn't it funny that it's so, um, a jam jar is a glass. I mean, it's so easy. You know, we never ever need to buy another glass. It's bonkers, isn't it, that we've been doing it for all of this time. And actually for the children, um, I know my children are older than yours, but they, um, they really find it a treat to have pudding, you know, and their pudding is, you know, yogurt and fruit in the glass because then they can see the layers and they call it an ice cream sundae but it's not an ice cream sundae it's just yogurt and fruit um and just something simple like that to just have uh have the yogurt in a jam jar instead of a bowl 
you know, his, it brings them so much joy and it looks really pretty and it's like, wow, I don't need to buy half the things I have in my kitchen. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, everyone. Have a beautiful evening and I will see you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye.